See, the concern I have, the reason I'm starting here, 166 squared plus 2, Vote from Alpha is an app on your phone, it's for the iPad, it's a website, it's everything. And there's the answer, there's the parabola, and over here I didn't log in yet, but if I did, I'd see step-by-step -step instructions, and it would show me how to organize and solve that equation if I'm an elementary kid and I'm doing word problems. Just to show you an example of word problems under examples, we have mathematics, we'll take elementary math, we'll go down to, you know, kids are pretty good, one and one, what's that? One and one. And, but then you say the train leaves New York at eight in the morning, Rhonda has 12, here I'll give you this problem. Can you solve this problem? Rhonda has 12 marbles more than Douglas, blah, blah, blah. Well, anyway, what Wolf from Alpha does is it reads, and it organizes the problem, tells you Douglas has 24, gives you all the breakdown, and generates every equation you need to solve that problem. Are you going to have teachers correct math? You're going you're to have all your teachers correct math? Kids could just go to Wolf from Alpha. Get their own assessment. But Wolfram Alpha is no good because you can go copy and not learn anything. And that, that's right. And that's a disaster. So block it on your network. That would be one of the first things. <laughs> right? And you can block that. Or, or, because all of this is about managing fear. I got to tell you, at the base of it, it's all about managing fear and loss. Some of you need therapy after this. Don't charge me, by the way. So in an age of both from Alpha, you wouldn't spoon feed kids math problems. You teach them to design their own. Right? This is real. This is this is real. Any question you ask that has an answer, it's Googleable or Wolfram Alphaable. I, I get it. I don't need my teacher to correct my work for me. What is that about? That teacher's jobs were invented before the internet was invented. This is before we had the answers, and the, before we had instant tutorials on everything. This is before we had this. So, your question. I have two doctoral students who are lieutenant colonels at West Point. Those guys do not fool around. You want to see some serious people who are into evaluating their work, teaching their students to evaluate their work? Go hang out at West Point. Go over there. They were the first school, by the way, to go one-to-one, -one, 1985, by an act of Congress. So these guys have been doing this a very, very long time, longer than you. Probably about 20 years longer than you. 30 years. West Point's figured out that giving students well-structured problems where we know the answer doesn't give you the skills you need when you graduate to solve real problems. Because real problems are messy. You don't get the information you need, you get too much information, you get too many people moving, you get too many moving parts, and you still have to make a decision. Fair enough? Yeah. West Point. Now, I know you're not training Army officers. I got that. Doesn't matter. Let's do the K-12 version of West Point. Uh, so, we got Wolf from Alpha. We got, uh, back to my article about this amazing math teacher. Um, I want to show you a Twitter. Um, um, did I leave that behind somewhere? That behind somewhere. Um, how Twitter can be. Now, many of your districts probably do block Twitter, but you'll get over that. That was a temporary loss of direction. All right. It's not Yankees. Ballpark, but it's the Rangers. It took me six months to convince this teacher to use her cell phone. Most teachers have cell phones, and they don't use them to help kids learn. So finally, she agrees to take a photograph. She teaches geometry, takes a photograph. That's her first tweet ever. Do you remember where's the perfect butt? Now, that's the first time any of these students have ever received a photograph on their cell phone. By the way, Twitter, you can set up text messaging with 40404. Do you know that? Yes, you can. 
Google that, 40404 and Twitter. You'll see the directions. <coughs> Excuse me. So all the kids were following her, and the phone rings. Every kid's phone rings. That's what we have to use. That's what they have on their body, their phone. We, we have to use kids' cell phones. We have to stop the nonsense that we're not going to use cell phones. That's not good. We just have to use cell phones. That's what they have. So kids get this, and the perfect bun, I don't know, some geometry problem. I don't know the math. But there's one spot on the infield where the little white ball is supposed to go. Perfect bun. Her phone did not stop ringing. She, she couldn't believe it. She, kid after kid after kid, wrong answers, right answers, but they were all engaged because it's a real problem, a little messy. Then she decided, then she got more clever, I think, more clever. She goes back to the ballpark a couple of days later. She has season tickets. And uh, we're going to say that her husband's drinking a Coke. <laughs> it's Texas. It's not a Coke. And uh, she says, involves something with volume. It doesn't say, what is the volume? I would have said, what's the volume? But she says, involves something with volume. I'll tell you what, why don't you do that? There's a cup. Design a problem that involves something with volume, and then I'll show you what the kids did. How's that? Fair? Because your question is, your question, if I understand your question, what's the first step we can take to teach kids to design their own problems? Is that your question? Twitter and a cell phone is a great first step that you start shooting photographs to kids, but they're messy. It's not, what is the volume? It's do something with volume. So not only are you teaching the mathematics, but you're teaching creativity and imagination. You're tapping that. I'll give you five minutes to come up with a creative problem that involves volume of that cup. Have, knock yourself out. Six, six, square plus two. Well, from Alpha is an app on your phone. It's for the iPad. It's a website. It's everything. And there's the answer. There's the parabola. And over here, I didn't log in yet, but if I did, I'd see step-by-step -step instructions. And it would show me how to organize and solve that equation. If I'm an elementary kid and I'm doing word problems, just to show you an example of word problems under examples. We have mathematics, we'll take elementary math, we'll go down to, you know, kids are pretty good, one and one, what's that? One and one. And, but then you say the train leaves New York at eight in the morning, Rhonda has 12, here, I'll give you this problem. Can you solve this problem? Rhonda has 12 marbles more than Douglas, blah, blah, blah. Well, anyway, what Wolfram Alpha does is it reads. And it organizes the problem, tells you Douglas has 24, gives you all the breakdown, and generates every equation you need to solve that problem. Are you going to have teachers correct math? You're going to, you're going to have all your teachers correct math? Kids can just go to Wolfram Alpha, get their own assessment. But Wolfram Alpha's no good because you can go copy and not learn anything. And that, that's right. And that's a disaster. So block it on your network. That would be one of the first things. Right? And block that. Or, or, because all of this is about managing fear. I got to tell you, at the base of it, it's all about managing fear and loss. Some of you need therapy after this. Don't charge me, by the way. So in an age of Wolfram Alpha, you wouldn't spoon feed kids math problems. You teach them to design their own. Right? This is real. This is, this is real. Any question you ask that has an answer, it's Googleable or Wolfram Alphaable. I, I get it. I don't need my teacher to correct my work for me. What is that about? That teacher's jobs were invented before the internet was invented. This is before we had the answers and the, before we had instant tutorials on everything. This is 
before we had this. So, your question. I have two doctoral students who are lieutenant colonels at West Point. Those guys do not fool around. You want to see some serious people who are into evaluating their work, teaching their students to evaluate their work? Go hang out at West Point. Go over there. They were the first school, by the way, to go one-to-one, -one, 1985, by an act of Congress. So these guys have been doing this a very, very long time, longer than you. Probably about 20 years longer than you. 30 years. West Point figured out that giving students well-structured problems where we know the answer doesn't give you the skills you need when you graduate to solve real problems. Because real problems are messy. You don't get the information you need, you get too much information, you get too many people moving, you get too many moving parts, and you still have to make a decision. Fair enough? Yeah. West Point. Now, I know you're not training Army officers. I got that. Doesn't matter. Let's do the K-12 version of West Point. Uh, so, we got Wolf from Alpha. We got... Uh, Back to my article about this amazing math teacher. Um, I want to show you a Twitter. Um, um, did I leave that behind somewhere? That behind somewhere. Um, how Twitter can be. Now, many of your districts probably do block Twitter, but you'll get over that. <laughs> that was a temporary loss of direction. Alright. It's not Yankees, ballpark, but it's the Rangers. It took me six months to convince this teacher to use her cell phone. Most teachers have cell phones, and they don't use them to help kids learn. So finally, she agrees to take a photograph. She teaches geometry. Takes a photograph. That's her first tweet ever. Do you remember where's the perfect butt? Now that's the first time. Any of these students have ever received a photograph on their cell phone. By the way, Twitter, you can set up text messaging with 40404. Do you, you know that? Yes, you can. Google that, 40404 and Twitter. You'll see the directions. <coughs> Excuse me. So all the kids were following her, and the phone rings. Every kid's phone rings. That's what we have to use. That's what they have on their body, their phone. We, we have to use kids' cell phones. We have to stop the nonsense that we're not going to use cell phones. That's not good. We just have to use cell phones. That's what they have. So kids get this, and the perfect bun, I don't know, some geometry problem. I don't know the math. But there's one spot on the infield where the little white ball is supposed to go. Perfect bun. Her phone did not stop ringing. She, she couldn't believe it. She, kid after kid after kid. Wrong answers, right answers, but they were all engaged because it's a real problem. A little messy. Then she decided, then she got more clever, I think, more clever. She goes back to the ballpark a couple days later. She has season tickets. And uh, we're going to say that her husband's drinking a Coke. <laughs> it's Texas. It's not a problem. And uh, she says, involves something with volume. It doesn't say, what is the volume? I would have said, what's the volume? But she says, involves something with volume. I'll tell you what, why don't you do that? There's a cup. Design a problem that involves something with volume, and then I'll show you what the kids did. How's that? Fair? Because your question is, your question, if I understand your question, what's the first step we can take to teach kids to design their own problems? Is that your question? Twitter and a cell phone is a great first step that you start shooting photographs to kids, but they're messy. It's not what is the volume, it's do something with volume. So not only are you teaching the mathematics, but you're teaching creativity and imagination. You're tapping that. I'll give you five minutes to come up with a creative problem that involves volume of that cup. 
Have knock yourself out. Is <laughs> because too many investments in technology do not have a strategy. It's a shopping list of stuff. And it, we end up very often with the $1,000 pencil, what I call the $1,000 pencil, where we take old work, the same way of teaching, the same culture, but we add technology. The research is overwhelming. You will not get any improvement. You won't get any improvement. Cisco is a client of mine, right? They're third or fourth largest technology company in the world, depending on how you measure things. And they, you know, they build switches and networks. And you know what Cisco does? They big company. And uh, pick a number of uh, impact of making building a network in an organization. Everybody gets a device that works. Bandwidth works. Help desk works. Software, seamless software. Everything works. Everything works. Technically, everything works. Pick a number of the impact on the quality. In corporate America, it's negative 3%. Goes down. After spending tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars. So spending money on technology that works is not sufficient. We, the real work is what teachers and kids do in classrooms. That's what we have to focus on is what do we really need to do so that the investment in technology, and now we have Common Core, so we have to link all that to Common Core, what do we do to make it all work so we're not wasting money and uh, investing a tremendous amount of money without improving achievement? So self-assessment. Let's, by the way, are, we okay? are you okay with self-assessment as a, as a valuable skill? Is, is that all right? Valuable skill? Self-assessment? Are we assuming that the student is going to be honest and critical and not just playing the game of like, if you want to hear? Yeah, no, let's assume it's real. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, let, let, let's, assume, let's assume that uh, you actually have a curriculum to teach kids to be self. Yeah. <laughs> Frankly, it's the responsibility of the teacher to teach the students to be self-assessing. One would think. One would think they're not born with it. That we will have to teach, right? I mean, I don't know, maybe you are born with it. But I wasn't. I, I certainly wasn't. I had to learn much better skills to assess my own work. When you look at the research, this is also Googleable. When you look at the research on expert behavior, the people who are really, really, really good at what they do, really good at what they do, like Tiger Woods, golfers, musicians, pro ball players, Nobel Prize winners, people really good at what they do. They have that skill. They question their own knowledge. Tiger Woods has a coach. Probably all the best golfers in the world have a coach who talk constantly are questioning how to get better, better, better. No, no pro athlete walks out without a coach, right? The best in the world know they don't know. Best in the world know they don't know, and they're striving for excellence, and it's knowing you're never there that's important, right? That's, too many kids are overconfident that they know things they don't really know. Can we, do you believe that? <laughs> do you have kids? I mean, <laughs> two kids. Um, so, yeah, so I'm worried that what the research says isn't part of the technology plan. I think it should be. I think we should go through what we know about learning and teaching and check off, can technology really help us there, right? Really help us there. I'll give you an example. I, I, I'll give you an example. Um, I'm influenced more by Eric Mazur than anybody else. Eric Mazur is the Dean of Applied Physics at Harvard. There he is, Eric Mazur. And uh, here, I'll show you. Um, we'll go back to this one in a second. But Eric Mazur uh, figured out that uh, you can, ah, 
Here, I want you to question this. Don't, don't let me get away with this unless you absolutely believe it. You can get very high test scores at Harvard without being able to apply the knowledge you were just tested on. Do you believe that? Yes. Everybody? Well, that's not good. <laughs> What's the point? What, what, what? Shouldn't we get more than test scores? Shouldn't we get understanding? Shouldn't we teach for understanding? Now, Common Core, theoretically, going to do that. So we're, we're, getting, we're getting better here. We're going from regurgitation assessments to assessments that are much more complicated and are going to require you to theoretically apply knowledge. So Eric Mazur found out, by the way, I'm just going to tell you what he's done. Why is it? Eric Mazur is the first guy to invent clickers. You know what I'm talking about? But he's a physicist. He needed feedback from his kids. So he invented clickers. In the beginning, they were all hardwired. Then he got the other technology, but clickers. And he invented, you're not going to believe this one, he invented Facebook. He did. Then Facebook. The Twinkle Winkle Twins were in his class. Remember they hired Zuckerberg to the movie? The Twinkle Winkle Twins had this idea. And they hired Zuckerberg to the programming. Zuckerberg stole it from them, and he owns them a chunk of money. But the Twinkle Winkle Twins stole it from Azor. He had it first. And they saw that. They said, whoa, that's good. By the way, he invented Facebook. Well, he didn't call it Facebook. But he invented this online system because he realized in trying to break high test scores but low understanding that the number one, what do you think the most important information is that a teacher needs that distinguishes somebody who just knows a lot about content to somebody who can really teach it well? What distinguishes somebody who just knows a lot of stuff from somebody who's really, really good at helping somebody else access that knowledge. Single most important source of information that a teacher needs to be the most effective teacher. Missouri thinks it's the questions of their students. The questions, the misconceptions, the confusion. Missouri believes that the best teachers in the world have radar and they can see inside of students' heads and they understand what students are thinking. But most teachers don't have radar. So Mazur didn't have radar either. So he decided to encourage students to ask questions in his classroom, 10%. Maybe he got 10%. This is at Harvard. And then he invents this online community, and he says to kids every day, I want you to ask one question every day, 100%. Do you believe that? With an online community where kids don't have to raise their hands in front of their friends, after school, you can get more kids asking questions than in a classroom. Who does not believe that in this room? Everyone believes that. All right, so every teacher, there's a good use of technology. Every teacher should have a running assignment. By the way, this leads to self-assessment. Every teacher should have a running assignment that every student every day asks a question. That alone would change the teacher's understanding of the children they're teaching. That alone. Outside Missouri, I can't find anyone else doing it. By the way, Missouri has a database. He understands technology. You can throw these questions into a database. He has 4,500 unique questions in Introduction to Physics, 4,500. They're all different. So I know Missouri, I talked to him a lot. And, uh, and I asked him one day, I said, of the 4,500 questions, how many had you heard in 30 years of teaching? He said 20%, 80%, I never even knew. I wouldn't even have predicted they were questions. I've never heard them. And frankly, he said, too, they're too stupid. I never would have thought of Harvard student. <laughs> you know, like uh, you gave us an example using baseball. Does it also work with a football? <laughs> it's the 
same planet, physics works both ways. <laughs> Stuff like that. I mean, it, it's just, the questions were just so amazing to Mazur, but he never got them, right? He never got them. Once he gets them, once you get questions from students, you know, he starts every class with a question. How does a teacher start a class? What, what makes you write a lesson plan? What, what are you thinking when you're planning for tomorrow? What are you thinking? What's in your mind? A chronology of the subject? What, what's logically next? Get rid of that. We have to start with what student, where students are, not where the teacher's mind is. We have to start where students are. If you, if you skip over where the students are, you've lost them. They're never more confused. So Missouri starts every class. With a question. Now I know I've lost probably half of you. I I probably have lost a lot of people in this room, but I don't and I don't have your questions. I don't just have, have faces. The only information I have is faces. And I don't think this is going well, frankly. Um, <laughs> so I'll tell you, I'll show you a little video. So Mazur took the year off, by the way. Here's Mazur. This would be two years ago at Harvard. It would be kids lined up in rows. You can still see rows in many schools. Uh, the furniture. Uh, they would all have a laptop. I sat in that very same room when I was a student at Harvard. Not changed a bit. Professor, it's the Eric Mazur show. He's in the front of the room. And he's the smartest kid in the class. He knows everything. And he's got videos and models, and oh my gosh, when you walk in, it's like the magic show. And uh, all in physics, and kids look smiling and fun. And he says, do you all understand? And everybody says, yes, we do. And oh my god, these kids are so well behaved, right? They all have a laptop. And it didn't change. So I just want to show you. Um, that was two years ago. Uh, today, you may want to type this in later, or you know, don't, don't listen to it all on your own machines right now. But if you type, uh, watch this video called AP50, this is his new classroom, completely different from the standard Harvard classroom. Uh, he got an old uh, attic, cleared it out. Never, this room had never been used before. What even a room? It was in an old physics building. When uh, I designed AP50, my main goal was to create a course where students could take ownership of their learning. Okay. In all of his research, it's same thing about students who, who PISA, you feel control over your own learning, the research from John Hattie of 850 research studies, students who can assess their own work. We're, we're beginning to see a merger from different fields that all end up in the same conclusion. People who own their learning have higher success than people who are dependent on someone else to manage their learning for them. Right? You don't have to agree, just for a moment. Withhold final conclusion. So what do you do about that? Let's say you buy in. Let, let's say you're in. By the way, you won't see Eric Mazur in this video teaching that's gone. In other words, they don't learn physics. Gone. Because we want them to learn physics, so we tell them to learn physics. No. They learn physics because they want to learn physics. So they really take ownership of this desire. Yesterday I was uh, teaching my doctoral class at the principal of Shabazz High School as a doctoral student. Newark, have you heard of Shabazz High School? I bet many of you have. I bet many of you have. Um, that school is no longer in jeopardy. The test scores are remarkably higher than when he took. Remarkable. It's amazing what this guy has done in Shabazz High School. Now, there's still violence in the neighborhood. There's still a, a phenomenally rough community. He can't change that. But he has 20% every year, which just adds up to about 80% of the total school taking AP Physics at Shabazz High School. Do you have 20% of your students taking AP Physics? 
the average in New Jersey is slightly less than three. AP physics. And uh, maybe you wouldn't have predicted that at Shabazz High School, 20% every year. Take AP physics now. Kids on the learning. It was Bob Goodman, do you know? He brought in a team that empowered students to manage their own learning. It's a powerful idea. So, Mazur, um, you won't see him anymore. A lot of collaborative work when you watch this video. Huge amount of collaborative work. But here's the interesting thing. iTunes U has caused a revolution in higher ed. iTunes U. Do you know what I'm talking about? Um, I better show you. So let's work backwards. Let's, let's work to where your kids were going to college, those kids. Let's work backwards. Um, my, uh, my son's taking college classes again. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he's, he's, taking, he's taking them at Harvard. So iTunes U is in iTunes, right? You have this little, little door called iTunes U. And you go to uh, universities and colleges, and then you get a list in the world. I, I can't blow this up. It's just too big of a chart. It's this massive list of colleges that have courses in iTunes U. It's just a list of colleges. And, and uh, so, so basically, all over the world, from China to California, you have professors at MIT kind of started this, where the chancellor said, you will podcast everything, you will give the world everything for free. It's all in iTunes U, right? Do you know about iTunes U? How many of you taken an iTunes U course in this room? Two, three, four, five? All right. So, uh, we get iTunes U, and all the course content is there. So, in the age of the internet, what's the purpose of a teacher? You can get knowledge without asking the teacher. I can watch videos, I can take interactive apps. Here, I'll, I'll show you in Texas, uh, which is a big client, the Superintendents Association in Texas is a big client of mine. So, what they did, I'll just show you, iTunes U, there's a K-12 section now, Apple never imagined this was going to go K-12, but wow, when I'm sharing, you better. How many of you have an iTunes U channel in this room besides Sharon? Nobody? Oh, you have work to do. Wow, okay, you have work to do. So let, let me just show you. So uh, under the T, I'm going to go to uh, Texas Association of School Administrators. That's the Texas... Superintendents Association. I'm going to click on that. And uh, then I'm going to show you the 20 high school courses that Texas looked at their test scores, found teachers who were achieving with uh, low socioeconomic students, brought them together in Austin in their subjects, a couple weekends, and with designers, they sent in designers with the teachers and they built these courses. They're free. You can take them. Are these well, this is high school. You're asking about sanctions. You mean testing? Well, no, I'm talking about, like, What's a sanction? Creationism. Oh, creationism? Um, yeah, they're free of that. Okay. These are free of that. Well, algebra doesn't have creationism. So let me just click on algebra for a moment. I mean, the, the Texas stuff that's weird like that, that's, that's little stuff here and there. I'm in Texas all the time. Yes, that is true, that is weird, but that's not here, right? I, I mean, I'm sorry if I just stepped on someone's religious views, but yeah, okay. So, I just want to show you algebra. So, there's clarifying A, B, there's 67 different units that you get in the course, and kids download this, and, uh, and boom, right? No, I guess not right. Okay. So, what I'm saying is, content 
it's going to move to the web. The 20, the 20 courses in Texas are all there. The 20 core, high, middle school's next, then elementary school, start a university. That's how a lot of things often go. We only think university kids can do it. That turns out first graders can do it. And we just have to take a while before we readjust and stop underestimating what young kids can do, which is a problem. We've got to stop that. Um, but in any case, that this is what's going to happen. The kids you are teaching in elementary school now, without, I pretty much without question, when, if they go to a university, their content is going to be online, not on paper. Is, is that okay for me to say? Your elementary kids, this is going to be their world, interactive, online, good. Then why go to class? Okay, so. We're not going to class to get teachers' knowledge. That's, that's not why we're going to class. I mean, it is now, but we're going to change that. And uh, back to AP 50. All right, so I'm not making this stuff up. Not yet, anyway. <laughs> AP 50. So, uh, you won't see Mazur. He has better attendance now than he did when he was at, without the online curriculum. Better attendance. And he's more important. See, I think teachers are going to be even more valued when they don't have to stand in front of a group and transfer their knowledge. Because now you can get the work done. Now you can get kids to apply knowledge. You can give them problems. You can, you can challenge them to understand their own assessments models. You can really teach them to learn how to learn instead of learn how to be taught. Learning how to be taught, that's what you're doing right now. And you're doing very well. You're passive, you're quiet, you're, you are well trained. But learning how to learn is different. None of you went on to get the junk out of you. Learning how to learn means you take action. You don't wait for permission. You just keep going. You're fearless. No fear in learning. You, and you know all kinds of skills of learning how to learn. All kinds of skills, which we're going to go over. So I hope there is some agreement in this room that there is a difference between learning how to be taught and learning how to learn. And that's that's where we lose a lot of people, because for those of you in leadership, I think I can teach teachers technology in an afternoon. Give me some application, I copy them. That sounds arrogant, but you get a 12-year-old to do it too. But what I cannot do in an afternoon is help a teacher let go of control. You cannot do that in an afternoon. But for some people, I just can't do it. <laughs> They are never, ever going to let go of control. It's hardwired. And so my opinion for why technology is not kicking in as much as we had hoped. We had hoped for amazing things when we bought this stuff and we're just not seeing it unless you tell me otherwise. Well, I'll show what amazing things are. We have first defined amazing things. I am convinced it's because we haven't helped teachers shift control. And that's one of the most important skills. So the problem is not a technology problem. You don't have a technology problem. You may have a common core problem. You may have a student motivation problem. You may have a work ethic problem. But you don't have a technology problem. Technology is supposed to be a solution, not a problem. So you don't have a technology problem. So what is the problem? The problem is student achievement. That's the problem. We have to figure out ways to have every kid excel. Technology is just a solution, although most times I think it's misguided and misdirected. <clears throat> OK. How's my attitude? <laughs> I'm a Red Sox fan. It's a problem. But, <laughs> that wasn't bad. Okay. Um, so, self-assessment. 
all of this soliloquy was starting with self-assessment. Here's a weird idea. But if some of you check this back, you might find some surprising results. Be prepared to reject it, by the way. I've had people go, are you kidding me? Over my dead body. I'm not going to do that. I said, okay, how do you know? Because I've been teaching for 30 years, and I can smell a stupid idea when I hear one. <laughs> Have you ever tried it? No, but I don't need to. I don't need to jump off a bridge either. But, okay, fine. Missouri took a sabbatical, went around the world, and found that most successful classroom in Indonesia. Would you believe that America is not the source of all <laughs> innovation and education? Uh, Indonesia. And he walks in, and these kids are sitting at tables kind of like you are, and he, when he walks in, one table of about six high fives, the whole table high fives. And he thinks this is a happy room. He goes over to the professor and says, what's going on? And the professor says, they're taking a test. That is not what tests look like at Harvard. You don't high five in the middle of the test, ever. You don't do that. And Missouri said, how's that going? And he said, oh, we're test score, it shows results. He went to this guy because he's had such success with student achievement. It wasn't a random classroom in Indonesia. And uh, here's how it goes. Because all the content is online, just assume it's online. You need some accountability to know whether the students watched the videos and did the work and thought about it. So the teacher gives a, uh, a 10 question test every day. Kids come in, they have to answer questions by themselves, by, them, by themselves. No high-fiving. Then as soon as the test is over, the teacher has arranged groups. The kids take the same test they just took, but in a group. And the group argues what's the answer to number one. Now, if you watch kids take a test, I want someone in this room to tell me I'm wrong. I could be wrong. I don't think there's much learning while kids take a test. We okay with that? Not much learning. But if you take the kids who just took that test and put them and have them take the same test again, there's a tremendous amount of learning. All of a sudden, there's this explosion of Socratic debate. Some kids get heated about it. Do you believe it? No learning, then there's learning. Now, it doesn't mean what you're learning is correct because you're talking with kids, not the teacher. But remember, we want to make thinking visible. This is one of the most important things for a teacher, is to understand what's going on in the thinking of their students. So the teacher is walking around the room listening to the debate. Now the teacher has information from the assessment experience of the group she does not get when you take an individual test. No thinking, just the answers. You need to know the student's thinking. And they say that out loud. General rule here, talk less, listen more. General rule, talk less, listen more. But something else happens. In conversation, kids remember stuff. They, they'll, they'll hear her say something, and that triggers something, and the conversation, and you know what? It turns out that learning is social. That people talking together and working through a problem and challenging one another and, and is, is, can be a very useful exercise. As long as it's productive, as long as the information's there, good teacher. So, the results at the end of the year. Yes, the kid might have gotten a 70 when they took the individual test, absolutely. And then they take the group test, and the second time, the team gets a 95. By the way, in Indonesia, they average the two. I've had teachers in this country, no, 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 can't do that, because then all the smart kids will just give the answers, there's no real learning taking place. Then I would suggest you put all the smart kids on one table, they'll fight for the last point. <laughs> They will fight. Watch those kids fight. And 
in the 70s, take all the kids who are average and put them at a table. I had a teacher do this in Texas, and they're getting 90s, the kids who all collectively got 70. Collectively, they got 70s. The group gets 95 taking this test. But the same kids who got 70s, none of them got a 95. How do you explain that? Because learning is social. Do any of you believe this process? That you take the same test twice. Okay, not done yet. Not done. Then, by the way, don't forget the part where the teacher is moving around the room, listening, listening, listening. The teacher's gaining insights. The teacher's understanding whether you listen or not, and what your reasoning is, and what your ill, what your missing gaps are. The teacher learns a lot. The third round is the team, each team has to look at the test and design a problem. They have to write one more test question that's more difficult than any question that was on the test. And it has to be an application question. Now you're teaching kids to write tests. That's a very, that helps kids self-assess. Teaching children to write a test that is more difficult than when the teacher put together, that's not a bad skill to give kids. Because now they're thinking about designing problems. All right, I'm going to stop there. Because I know I've already probably broken every rule of taking tests and what kids designing tests and How do you do it gradually? I'll show you. Uh, Twitter would be my answer to that. <laughs> quick, quick answers, Twitter. Let me give you the example on Twitter. The good news today is I, I don't just make stuff up. I can show you real things. Um, I used to just make stuff up, and that wasn't so good. Um, let's see. My website is novemberlearning.com. I know my website. And on my website, we have resources. That would be it. If you're on my website, it's a tab going across, resources. And going down resources, I got a bunch of articles. Some of you might find these useful later if you want to review some stuff and podcasts. And so we've got um, somebody in the room was telling me that Wolfram Alpha, you like Wolfram Alpha. Right, did I show it to you? Or, yeah, I showed it to you. Why do you love it? Why? Just This is going to connect. It, okay. I love Wolfram Alpha because it limits your search to more relevant information. Yes, That's it's, all, it's all clear. It cuts through the cloud. That's right. Wolfram Alpha. Wolfram Alpha will also solve any math equation you give K-12 and show you how to solve the problem. Every single equation you have. Wolfram Alpha? No? Yes. Uh oh. All right. I got to step one step back. Show you Wolfram from Alpha first to answer your question, right? Just let me go back and then come back to your question. I'm not losing your question. So what? So let's just add really quick. I just broke that. Sorry, Jay. Put that on my chart. Um, so uh, Jay's so forgiving. Um, Wolfram from Alpha, just to show you. Take any equation, anything, calculus, trigonometry, algebra, pre-algebra, anything, 6x, right, squared, plus 2, equals 8, type in the word solve, get that going, 6x squared plus 2, Wolfram from Alpha is an app on your phone, it's for the iPad, it's a website, it's everything. And there's the answer, there's the parabola, and over here, I didn't log in yet, but if I did, I'd see step-by-step -step instructions, like and it would show me how to organize and solve that equation if I'm an elementary kid, and I'm doing word problems, just to show you an example of word problems under examples. We have mathematics, we'll take elementary math, we'll go down to, you know, kids are pretty good one and one, what's that? One and one. And, but then you say the train leaves New York at eight in the morning. 
Rhonda has 12. Here, I'll give you this problem. Can you solve this problem? Rhonda has 12 marbles more than Douglas, blah, blah, blah. Well, anyway, what Wolfram Alpha does is it reads, and it organizes the problem, tells you Douglas has 24, gives you all the breakdown, and generates every equation you need to solve that problem. Are you going to have teachers correct math? Yeah. You're, going to, you're going to have all your teachers correct math? Kids can just go to Wolfram Alpha, get their own assessment. But Wolfram Alpha is no good because you can go copy and not learn anything. And that, that's right. And that's a disaster. So block it on your network. That would be one of the first <laughs> Right? And block that. Or, or, because all of this is about managing fear. I got to tell you, at the base of it, it's all about managing fear and loss. Some of you need therapy after this. Don't charge me, by the way. So in an age of Wolfram Alpha, you wouldn't spoon feed kids math problems. You teach them to design their own. Right? This is real. This is, this is real. Any question you ask that has an answer, it's Googleable or Wolfram Alphaable. I, I get it. I don't need my teacher to correct my work for me. What is that about? That teacher's jobs were invented before the internet was invented. This is before we had the answers and the, before we had instant tutorials on everything. This is before we had this. So, your question. I have two doctoral students who are lieutenant colonels at West Point. Those guys do not fool around. You want to see some serious people who are into evaluating their work, teaching their students to evaluate their work? Go hang out at West Point. Go over there. They were the first school, by the way, to go one-to-one, -one, 1985, by an act of Congress. So these guys have been doing this a very, very long time, longer than you. Probably about 20 years longer than you, 30 years. West Point figured out that giving students well-structured problems where we know the answer doesn't give you the skills you need when you graduate to solve real problems. Because real problems are messy. You don't get the information you need, you get too much information, you get too many people moving, you get too many moving parts, and you still have to make a decision. Fair enough? West Point. Now, I know you're not training Army officers. I got that. Doesn't matter. Let's do the K-12 version of West Point. Uh, so, we got Wolfram Alpha. We got, uh, back to my article about this amazing math teacher. Um, I want to show you a Twitter. Um, um, did I leave that behind somewhere? That behind somewhere. Um, how Twitter can be. Now, many of your districts probably do block Twitter, but you'll get over that. That was a temporary loss of direction. All right. It's not Yankees, ballpark, but it's the Rangers. It took me six months to convince this teacher to use her cell phone. Most teachers have cell phones, and they don't use them to help kids learn. So finally, she agrees to take a photograph. She teaches geometry. Takes a photograph. That's her first tweet ever. Do you remember, where's the perfect butt? Now, that's the first time any of these students have ever received a photograph on their cell phone. By the way, Twitter, you can set up text messaging with 40404. Do you know that? Yes, you can. Google that, 40404 and Twitter. You'll see the directions. <coughs> Excuse me. So all the kids were following her, and the phone rings. Every kid's phone rings. That's what we have to use. That's what they have on their body, their phone. We, we have to use kids' cell phones. We have to stop the nonsense that we're not going to use cell phones. That's not good. We just have to use cell phones. That's what they have. So kids get this, and the perfect bun, I don't know, some geometry problem. I don't know the math. But there's one spot on the infield where the little white ball is supposed to go. Perfect fun. Her phone did not stop ringing. She, she couldn't believe it. She 
kid after kid after kid. Wrong answers, right answers, but they were all engaged because it's a real problem, a little messy. Then she decided, then she got more clever, I think, more clever. She goes back to the ballpark a couple days later. She has season tickets. And uh, we're going to say that her husband's drinking a Coke. <laughs> it's Texas. It's not a Coke. And uh, she says, involve something with volume. It doesn't say, what is the volume? I would have said, what's the volume? But she says, involve something with volume. I'll tell you what, why don't you do that? There's a cup. Design a problem that involves something with volume, and then I'll show you what the kids did. How's that? Fair? Because your question is, your question, if I understand your question, what's the first step we can take to teach kids to design their own problems? Is that your question? Twitter and a cell phone is a great first step that you start shooting photographs to kids, but they're messy. It's not, what is the volume? It's do something with volume. So not only are you teaching the mathematics, but you're teaching creativity and imagination. You're tapping that. I'll give you five minutes to come up with a creative problem that involves volume of that cup. Have, knock yourself out. <laughs>